Stand up here for you. Yeah, do that, man. <laughs> I need all the support I can get, so. We're here for you, Jackie. Okay, I'm a nag. My name's Jackie. Hey. You know what? I was going to read that shit that Joe read. <laughs> Fuck my whole program up. Man. So, because I know how to be flexible, I'm just going to regroup. But I am going to have to take a deep breath. You know, I, I don't get nervous anymore speaking in front of people. I used to get nervous like a motherfucker, man. Take it to the mic. Huh? Can you hear me? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so I wonder if we could take a moment together and just like do the serenity prayer so I can gather my thoughts about what it is God wants me to say. It's not going to be about what I want to say. If you're new in here and you're offended by the word God, get over yourself. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. You know, I love that prayer because what it says is that there are lots of stuff I have to accept. I have to accept that I have no power over you. I have to accept that, you know, when it's time to change, I gotta do it. I gotta work on myself. I can't fix nobody in this room. I hope that I, I hope that I can give you a clear message though tonight. Uh, sometimes I give clear messages and sometimes I just talk out of the side of my fucking neck. So uh, if that happens tonight, forgive me and pray for me, okay? But um, I, um, when I think about my life, I think about when I was a kid. The first time I ever got traumatized, I was five years old. Uh, I grew up in Eugene, Oregon, and I, I played with everybody. I, Played with kids didn't look nothing like me and all that stuff. My mom was raised in Atlanta, Georgia. She took me to Atlanta, Georgia, and uh, I was different. And there was a side of the street I was supposed to be on, and the side of the street I couldn't be on. You know? And I didn't know any of that stuff because I was used to going everywhere. I was mingling with folks and being okay with them. And uh, ran into this family. And they called me every name in the world and told me they were going to kill me. I'm five years old, and I'm, I'm, I'm in my mind's eye, I'm saying, what did I do to you? How did I hurt you? Why are you mad at me? Why are you mad at me? And they just kept on growling at me, telling me they were going to kill me, and they were going to hurt me. And I know that in the years to follow, a lot of my behavior was based on that. I got in fights all the time, you know. And I had this feeling inside of me of pain. I was hurting all the time. I never felt good enough. I always felt like everybody else was better than me, you know? If you had blonde hair and blue eyes, you were better than me. If, you, if your skin was white, you were better than me. And I could never get past that. And, and, I, and it ate me up inside. It ate me up inside, you know? And so I struck out at people. I fought, I fought all the time. The only thing, and I, I gotta say, I believe that drugs saved my life because they numbed me out so I didn't feel that pain. See, by the time I got to drugs, I was in physical pain and emotional pain, you know? And I was angry. Oh God, I was so angry. But really I was just hurt. Like Jill said earlier, I was just hurt. I was hurt that I was pushed aside because of how I looked, you know? I didn't have no say in how I looked, you know? It, it was about genetics and genes and all that stuff, you know? But it wasn't, I didn't choose this. But people acted like I did. You know, and they treated me like I, I didn't have a brain in my head. You know, I remember in the third grade, I had this third grade teacher that I couldn't do math, and I was trying to get her to help me do math. And I said, "Can you help me do this? I don't know, I understand it. Can you help me do this?" She goes, "Don't worry about it. Your people never become anything but shoe shine boys and bus boys and shit like that." And so that was another thing that just added on to that stuff that was going on with me, and, and it killed me that people were so judgmental. 
and I just didn't know how to accept all that was going on. So um, anyway, fast forward, moving on, you know, I, I had a lot of fights and I, and, and, and I stayed in, in and out of jail, like every three days I was in and out of jail, you know. And, and I never hooked it up to the pain that I was feeling. See, the pain that I was feeling made me act out in a certain way, you know. Uh, so when, when I found drugs, I still acted out, but it was the drugs control me. I never had any control over anything, and I thought I was in control of everything. That's what I thought, you know. I thought I had, I thought I had a dial, and sometimes I walk around and pop my collar, you know. I, shit, I got it going on, you know. Y'all just don't know, you know. But the reality was, that I didn't have no control over nothing, not a damn thing, you know? Because it, it was either the pain driving me, or it was the drug use driving me. But I had no control over any of it, none. So by the time, I, I'm, I'm not gonna hang out in my using stuff, I'm not gonna hang out in that. I'm, um, because, because we're all addicts in here and we know, we know addict behavior. It's the obsession, the compulsion, the denial, and the spiritual void that drives us oftentimes. I didn't have a very good contact with a higher power. Um, I kind of did for about two years of my life. I guess when I, from the age of 10 to 12, uh, I went to church and I, and I liked it because it was one of those gospel churches where everybody partied, danced, and shit like that, you know? So, so it was real cool, you know? And then, uh, the preacher's telling me how to live, but he ain't living the way he's telling everybody else to live because he's creeping around. You know, he's talking about don't fornicate. He's creeping around fornicating. So, and I peep his game, so I'm like, shit, man, fuck this. <laughs> I ain't coming back here to have this man lie to me, you know? So, so I lost it all. And then by the time I was 13 years old, I was experimenting with everything, you know? And, um, but I, but I still had this fantasy. I had this fantasy about who I was going to be. You know, I, I thought that I would be a professional athlete. I thought I was going to be a professional athlete. And I thought I was going to be good enough to play some football and stuff like that. So, but I broke my hip at 15 years old. I broke my hip playing. It wasn't even really a football game. It was just some bullshit game we made up, you know. We had a baseball bat, we had a, a football, and we were hitting the football with the baseball bat, and we were running, and people would try to tackle you. It was just a bullshit game. It wasn't even a football game. <laughs> but we were, we were playing that shit, and, uh, and all of a sudden, somebody hit me, and next thing I know, I'm down, and my foot is up here over my head. Yeah, that's what happens when you break your hip, you know. <laughs> I'm 15 years old, my foot's up here over my head, I'm freaking out in my head, because I know it ain't supposed to be there, you know what I'm saying? I'm freaking out. And, um, and I, somebody got my mom there, and my mom was like making shit worse, you know? She was trying to soothe me, but she was making shit worse. Come on, baby, you gonna be okay, baby, pat me on. I ain't gonna be okay, I'm just lying to me. Anyway, so, so, uh, so, you know, after that, it crushed all my dreams and my fantasies and my hope. And I had hope of something that was never going to be, never going to be. And I could, I had a hard time digesting that, you know, because there was something I wanted to be. I, I thought that that third grade teacher had lied to me. I was going to be something more than a bus or a dishwasher or that kind of shit. I just had that, that dream inside of me. And, um, and then when it was crushed, I was like, well, maybe I ain't going to be shit. And then I had my mom, when she get mad at me, she said, well, you're rotten, you're like your dad. You know, and she did that enough times to find where I said, fuck it, yeah, I'm gonna be worse than him. I'm gonna be worse than him. I made a commitment to be worse than him, you know? And so I was in trouble all the time. And now, if, you, I, if none of you have ever had a town course me invite you to leave, then you, you don't know nothing about me. Because <laughs> the whole town of Eugene didn't want my black ass up in there, you know? They was like, ah. But anyway, so... <laughs> So uh, when, I, when I got busted, I, I'm going to move it forward to that because I never thought I would ever live without drugs. I never thought I would. I was in too much pain and, uh, and at the time drugs were the answer. They were right to see the answer. And I don't know what the question was, but, but they were definitely the answer. Anyway, as time went on, they became the problem. They became the problem. I was getting busted for sales and all kinds of shit. I got busted for, Harry used to say, man, dope things in Eugene can't get no dope. Jack is selling it all to the police. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was like, like, fuck. 
So, so yeah, I, I, you know, I was selling a lot of dope and I got busted and I kept on selling to the same cop. I couldn't believe that. I mean, I told him, I said, I think you're a cop. If you bust me, I'm gonna kill you. That was the dumbest thing I ever said. Cause when he came back to bust me, he had that gun bouncing off my head and he was, I could feel him shaking. And I thought, this motherfucker's gonna kill me. <laughs> but, but I, you know, I, that changed my whole life, that getting busted right there. Because they, I, when I went to court, they were promising to give me 50 years in the penitentiary. And I was 24 years old. I would still be in there right now, you know. And, um, but this treatment program called Freedom House, that one that Harry went through too, um, came and snatched me up. It was interesting because they didn't let me, I couldn't even walk out the front door of the jailhouse. I had to wait till they got there to pick me up. They picked me up, they put me in the car, they had this big damn dog in the back with me that was growling at me all the fucking time. I was like, at that time I was kind of leery about big dogs, you know, because I'd been bitten by a few of them. So, so, you know, I didn't put my hand on the doorknob or any of that stuff because I didn't want the dog to freak out and bite me and shit like that. But on the ride, he kept on growling at me. 109 miles, this motherfucker's growling at me. And that wasn't even the biggest thing. When I got to Freedom House, it felt like everybody was growling at me. See, I didn't have drugs as a buffer no more. I was detoxing. I was withdrawing from that heroin that I was shooting. And I, man, I, everything was magnified. Everything that happened. People would do something and it hurt my feelings. They used to call me Eggshell Johnson in the treatment because I was so sensitive. They just kept on saying, your motherfucking ass is going to break. We're going to say some shit to you, and you're going to crack. <laughs> you're going to crack. And I, and it never felt. I, I was telling people in there, if you keep on fucking with me, I'm going to break your jaw. That's all, that's all I knew. That's all I knew. I was in so much pain, I was ready to strike out. I was ready to touch somebody, you know? And um, so when I got there, I don't, I don't think about this often, but I got to think about it now. Uh, I spent most of the time on the bench because I couldn't get it right because I was threatened everybody in the house, you know, and um, I was so filled with pain and, and didn't have good tools, coping skills that helped me work through that stuff. And um, I threatened a lot of people. And um, they, they said, they had this thing they called a the privilege. It was a bench. They would set my ass on that bench. I held the record for sitting on that bench, by the way. Uh, and, and what bench is, is, it's supposed to be a discipline to shortstop you from going to the penitentiary. So they set you on that bench, and that bench is hard. It ain't got no gear for your butt. And you sit on that bench for, from 7 in the morning to 11 at night, okay? So uh, in sitting on that bench, I damn near thought I was going to die, man. I, I mean, it was hard. I sat on it for 11 days the last time I was on it. And... Uh, so you sit on, you can't get up and go to the bathroom. You can't make eye contact with anybody. If you make eye contact, they give you more days. You can't do any of that kind of stuff, you know. And so I'm on that bench. I'm having to pray. I'm having to start my connection with God because I'm thinking I'm going to run out the front door. And they also propped the fucking front door open, hoping I would run off. I, think, I believe that's what they thought, that I was going to run off. But I sat there. I sat there and I was miserable and I was in pain. I was in pain the whole time, you know. But when I prayed, I realized that when I prayed, I wasn't in as much pain, see? But when I was just sitting there being mad at them, the pain intensified. That taught me something about pain and, and about, about anger and what that would do to a person, see? That pain and that anger had me thinking, man, fuck, I'm gonna run off, I won't get caught, you know? You know, it was just bullshit. Because here's the thing, every time I get out of jail, I say, man, I'm gonna quit this shit, I'm going to do something different, and, and, and it seemed like without my ability to control anything, I would get out of jail and I'd go to the dope man's house. I wouldn't go to a treatment center, I wouldn't go to an NA meeting or none of that stuff. I would go to the dope man's house every time I got out of jail. And it's almost like, man, I, I, it's like I didn't have any power to change that. None of that, man. I just, anyway, it was crazy. So anyway, so when I'm, in, when I'm in Freedom House, I'm thinking about that whole thing. I'm thinking about what the process was for me. It never changed. It always was the same. When I'd get out of jail, I would go back to what I, I was familiar with. I wouldn't do the difficult stuff. I wouldn't do the stuff that made me uncomfortable. Change is an uncomfortable process. 
doing the same shit is not uncomfortable. It's comfort. See? So, I got a saying. There's no comfort. There's no comfort in, in, uh, in doing the same thing. I, there's no, excuse me, there's no comfort in change, in recovery. In comfort, fuck, I can't even remember how I said it now. <laughs> hey, I'm having a senior moment, man. I'm 72 fucking years old, okay? So, so sometimes, sometimes shit gets twisted when I start talking. <laughs> in my brain, it goes, Whoop! Anyway, so, <laughs> so pray for me, okay? <laughs> What the hell is this on this counter? What is it? Oh, it's a recorder. Oh, shit. You're not going to be able to sell any of these things. Okay. Okay. So. Wow. Now I am nervous. Okay. So, so anyway, in Freedom House, man, I, I learned some stuff. I really learned some stuff by staying and walking through stuff. I was the last person to graduate from that program. They never thought I would ever graduate. And I never thought I would either. But I think it's because of the conscious conduct that I have with the power greater than myself that I was able to do that. I don't know that I would have been able to do that without that power in my life. I just don't know. I think I would have been in jail or back using or something, man. You know? And I had to acknowledge the power in my life. I couldn't just talk about it. Man, I really had to acknowledge it and understand that it was working in my life and see how it was working in my life. You know? I think that sometimes I get caught up in I rush through life so quickly, I don't acknowledge and I don't thank God for every day that I have alive and clean, you know. And it's important for me to do that. It's important. Because listen, I ain't no day at the beach. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit squirrely, okay? About that much, okay? But, uh, but the truth of the matter is, man, is that, you know, one day at a time, I'm willing, I'm willing to do whatever it takes to stay clean. And I'm willing to do whatever it takes to grow and change. I'm okay with being uncomfortable in that change process. I really am. There was a time where I wasn't and I wouldn't allow myself to do it. Do different things, be in different areas of Portland and do it, you know, man, I hate hiking. I hate camping, but guess what? I, I will do that shit. <laughs> if it means that, that I'm changing something, I will do it, you know? So I'm, I'm willing to do those things that it takes to make, that, to make those changes, man, you know? And, um, I think the only reason why I'm still here, 47 years later, is because of that, that whole notion, that whole idea. You know, I, I really wish I could take more credit for my clean, but I can't. There are people that have helped me stay clean. There are people that, uh, that were in my life leading the way, you know, and just pumping knowledge or information into me and asking me to apply it. Because knowledge without application is bullshit. That's what they used to say. Knowledge without application is bullshit. If you're not applying the stuff you're talking about, then you're full of shit. That's what they would tell me. You have to put, make sure you're applying that stuff. You know, we used to say to people when they came into the program, me and Harry used to say this all the time, if you're powerless, act like you're powerless. Quit acting like you got so much fucking power. You know? Because we want them to stay clean. We want them to stay clean. We want them to stay here. You know, recognize the insanity of addiction. We would say to people, Recon second step, recognize the insanity of addiction. And that you need, that we need a power greater than ourselves to make it, to do, create some sane behavior. Recognize when you need to turn that shit over to a power greater than yourself, we used to say to them. Recognize that stuff. That's third step, man. Turn my will and my life over the care of God as I understand them. Listen, this is a 12-step program. We might as well do the 12 steps. Ain't that right? Can I get an amen? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the other thing, if I don't know about myself and I don't know who I am, I am doomed to make mistakes that will kill me. That's why they have that fourth step. So I can do a thorough, get a thorough understanding of myself and not be bullshit. And once I get that understanding, I have to apply it. I have to apply it and I have to say, yeah, this is me, this is who I am, you know? And not be ashamed of who I am. The biggest gift that this program has given me is that I like who I am. Now, I ain't everybody's cup of tea, but I like who I am, you know? I like this cat that stands for something. I stand for something, man. I love what Jill said about integrity and honesty, man. You know what, I will tell you bad shit about myself. 
You know, because it's the truth. But I will also tell you, you know, that I've done some stuff around here that's pretty cool. I don't tell everybody that though, because it sounds like, it feels like ego to me to talk about all the stuff I've done. And I want to be humble. I want to be humble enough so that, so that I can remain here. See, I think humility is the thing that keeps me coming back. You know, not boasting about who I am, but actually acknowledging the people that help me. And, and I, I get help right today from people that have less time than me. You know. 10 minutes? That's all? Shit. Okay. <laughs> okay. I got radical acceptance about a lot of things in my life, you know? People say shit I don't like. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Got to back up. So, uh, you know, okay, I'm going to try to bring this to some closure. Um, in my life, in my being clean, I've had a lot, of, a lot of wonderful gifts, man. The first gift was being able to raise my son. You know, I had a son that was traumatized. He watched his mother be killed. And, um, and I, I, I'm four years clean at the time he comes to stay with me. And so I, you know, if he hadn't came to me, I would have been walking around circles and going, blah, 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 you know, blubbering. But he came to me and I had to get clear and serious about this thing called life. And I had to be able to support him and nurture him because the kid was broken. He was broken. He would cry at night, man, just, I mean, curdling screams, you know, because he's seen his mom get her head blown off and the guy that killed her killed himself. And he got to watch all that. At five years old, he got to see all of that. And here I am trying to, trying to help this kid, and I'm still wounded myself. But what, what I found out that happened, I healed through helping him. I didn't heal through helping myself. I healed through helping him. I think that's the magic of Narcotics Anonymous, that we heal through helping each other, you know. And I had to help this kid, and I started healing. That, that pain that I had inside me that was eating me up and that was controlling my behavior, I started healing, you know. And I started feeling better about myself. I started feeling like I was worthwhile. I started feeling that stuff they talk about, self-esteem, I started feeling that. But I also realize that there's some people that I can't touch and help. But, but if we get enough people in Narcotics Anonymous, we can reach everybody. You know? I love this program. And I, I think if God made anything better than that, he kept it for himself. Because Narcotics Anonymous is an amazing program and it heals people. I know a guy that had schizophrenia, paranoid schizophrenia. And before he started working the steps, I seen him and he was crazy as fuck. <laughs> He started working the steps. And man, everybody appreciated him and came to love him. Appreciated the words that came out of his mouth. When he talked, it was silky and smooth and, 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 and his words embodied love and concern for people. And I used to just kind of go, I mean, he had me slobbering over myself, you know, because it, it was so silky and, and he would always talk about the program and what the program had given him and the light that it turned on inside of him. You know? This program is amazing. With application, man, it works. It just works. It doesn't matter who you are and what, what's going on with you. It will work. I'm going to tell you, I came, in, I came in here as a guy that suffered from major depression. I had PTSD. Now, these are, these are uh, uh, professional diagnoses, but, but I had all this stuff going on. I had uh, anxiety, severe anxiety. And today, man, I tell you what, that shit don't get in my way. It don't get in my way. But it used to kill me. It used to cripple me, you know. It stopped me from excelling in, the, in my chosen field. It stopped me from doing that. And, uh, all, but all I ever wanted to do was be a counselor any fucking way. So, you know, I'm where I wanted to be. But, you know, but I could have had better jobs. I could have had better situations. But I, those character defects that I came in with, Stop me. So I'm going to tell you right now, if we work the steps, there's no stopping. No stopping. You can't go on fucking vacation around the steps. You've got to work them. Better yet, you've got to apply them. Hold it. Let me quit saying you. i got to apply them. i got to work them. You don't have to do shit. You can do whatever you want to do. <laughs> but i got to work them and apply them. And I don't want to say you because I'm not preaching to you. I'm, I'm just telling you. Listen, in my life, there's no substitute for for my life. No, no thing, nothing else 
could make me be here alive today talking to you guys. Nothing else. Well, maybe except my kid. I would come if something was going to happen to my kid if I didn't come. But I will tell you this right now. Narcotics Anonymous is so wonderful that I'm going to be here. And, and I don't like to speak all the time. Don't get me wrong. I it sounds like I do, but I don't. <laughs> I mean, because I'm talking like that. Anyway. <laughs> be kind to yourself. And, I, and you know, and that's the miracle of this program, is us being kind to ourselves. You know, when we want to call ourselves stupid, and we don't, we say loving things to ourselves. You know, it's because of this program that I can even utter those words to myself. Because I used to, I took on what people were saying to me and I started doing it to myself. You ain't shit. You never be shit. Da 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 da. You know, you know you're worthless. You, you, you don't have any intelligence. You have no value, you know. All them things are not true. I stuck around long enough for them not to be true. Because when I first got it, if I would have left right away, they probably would end up true. True, excuse me. So, what do you think? Am I close? Okay, 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 cool. I don't, you know, time flies and I just don't know. So anyway, uh, I want to say this. I want to say this. I, I was going to read this, but Jill read it so you guys know what it is. But I want to say this to you guys. For me, for me, just coming here and speaking to you guys helps me. I hope it helps somebody in this room. If it doesn't, okay. But I, but I know you laid out a hell of a message, so I know that people got some help from that. Because I did. I got on fire when she was talking. As a matter of fact, she told my story mostly, except for I didn't live in houses that didn't have no electricity and shit. But but I stayed a few times in a place that had cockroaches. Yeah, I'd rather have no electricity. <laughs> yeah, that was nasty. No fire. But anyway, uh, so I want to tell you, you never have to visit those old places ever again. And see, what's back there? It's back there for a reason. It's a reference point that I can look at and say. I'm doing some behavior that resembles the behavior I did back there, you know? So I don't want to do that same behavior, so I have to change something, man. I have to change what I'm doing. And I might be uncomfortable, but 90 days of doing the same thing will change some behavior for you. 90 days. I, I, you know, so try it. I mean, this for me, it's work. 90 days of just doing something different and not doing the same thing over and over again has been amazing, tremendous. You know, I've gotten to work with a lot of people, a lot of people that have stayed clean. Got to, uh, got a hell of a sponsorship tree. Matter of fact, who's all in the sponsorship tree? Can you guys stand up? Can you stand up, please? Is that it? Come on now, come on now. All right, all right, all right. Thank you guys, thank you guys. You know what? Sponsorship will help you to stand. Well, has helped me to stand up. It's helped me to stand up. It's helped me to be feel like I'm counted. It's helped me to feel like I belong. You know, and it's helped me to feel like I I got something to say that people want to hear. You know, and that that's amazing for me. That's amazing. <laughs> may not be for you, but for me, it's amazing that people are actually listen. You know, and take in what's going on. So you know what? I love recovery. I love the people in this room. I don't have to like everybody, but I love the people in this room. I love that you showed up, suited up and showed up. If you keep, if you keep on doing that for your recovery, man, you'll be up here one day talking about, man, I got, I got 40 years. <laughs> I don't know how the fuck I got it, but I got it. <laughs> Crazy motherfucker told me I would get it if I kept on coming back. And it's true, it's true. It's, it's a one day at a time thing, and it, it's simple. It's really simple. And I know we're complicated people, and you guys have probably heard that a thousand times, but it's true that we're complicated people, and we, want, we can fuck up a wet cream. So, so it's important. <laughs> okay, okay, I'll take ownership for that one. I can fuck up a wet cream. So, so, so I think it's to our benefit that we, that, we, uh, that we make sure that we keep on coming back and that we work, we grab new people, and that we grab the book, we grab a basic text, or, or uh, it works how and why, or the, the, a flat book, or something. Now I got here before any of these books got here. 
you know? So we had to be creative. We had to be creative. And so what we would say, like there's a saying in the book, in the basic text, it says, an addict, any addict, can stop using, lose the desire to use, and find a new way to live. We used to simplify it. We used to say, okay, I got one minute. We used to say, if I can do it, you can do it. We just simplified that whole fucking message. See, the fact that I'm staying here, I'm staying clean, and I got a little bit of money in my pocket. I think about a hundred. I better not say that. I got a little bit of money in my pocket. And, uh, and, and man, you know what? Today, life is beautiful. It's beautiful. And I, and I encourage you to stay around. Just stay around and get a piece of this. Just a taste of it. If you get a taste of it, it's like dope. It's better than dope, actually. Because you ain't got to pay for it. You got, but you got to do the work. That's the payment. Doing the work is the payment. You know? And guess what? Some, some good dope might last you four hours. This will last you a lifetime. A lifetime. As long as you're willing to work for it. Anyway, I think that's my time. Timekeeper told me to shut the fuck up. So I'm, <laughs> so, so I'm going to chill out. Anyway, God bless you guys. And thank you, committee, for asking me to And love you guys. I have asked Krista to come up and read just for today. Hi, I'm Krista, I'm at it.